10 years ago, you famously said you don't raise NFC Championship banners, you raise Super Bowl banners, and if you don't deliver that to hold you directly accountable. This yep. year you said the season would have been a success even if you'd lost the NFC Championship. So in those 10 years, has your sh thinking shifted at all on this issue? No, I mean, I, I just didn't think you can't be ashamed of a successful season, right? And our goal is always going to be to win Super Bowls. And even if we won the game, it's not like, okay, well, we can take off 2024 because we won the Super Bowl in 2023. Our goal is always going to be the same. But I, what I've learned in, in my time as CEO, it, it's not a complete failure to not win where I, I had probably more of a, you either win the Super Bowl or you 100% lose. You, you can't not celebrate the fact that we've accomplished some really good things with this team. And I would trade a lot of good seasons for winning a Super Bowl, but we've collectively had a very, very successful program. And I wanna make sure that we continue to do that. And the only way to win the Super Bowl, you have to get there first. And we've obviously been very close several times and you have to keep building off of it, but you, you can't, you can't, it's funny, I, I mean, I think you and I talked about this, Matt, like a little off the record over a drink, where it's like, it's almost worse to lose the Super Bowl than to not make the playoffs. And I don't, I don't think that's how teams should feel, right? And as, as much as I would give just about anything to have won the, this game or four years ago against Kansas City, you can't leave and say, you know, the, 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 the whole season was, was a disgrace. Like, it's not. It, 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 it's, a, it's a disappointment to not win, but you can't destroy yourself and destroy everything that you've built because you didn't finish and, and hit your ultimate goal. That doesn't mean we're not going to work towards it and do everything that we can to continue to build this thing so we get back there and go win it in New Orleans this year. But that's, that's my feeling about it. Jim, you talked about building a successful program. This, this roster is largely built through the draft. That, that is what you guys did. And then the last few years, understandably going for it, making trades. Right. Being back in the first round this year, knowing that you're going to have to pay your quarterback here pretty soon, uh, do you feel like you kind of have to shift back now to, to making sure that the draft is you, kind of the lifeblood? You life always have to make sure that the draft is the lifeblood, right? Like they, that's the only way to have sustained success. And, you know, we made a decision to invest three first round picks into a quarterback that it didn't turn out to be the right choice. We got very lucky and very fortunate that a guy that we drafted in the seventh round made up for that. So, you know, in my mind, we invested three first round picks into the position, not into necessarily the, the one specific player. Because that's the most important position that exists. But you, you can't rely on filling your needs through free agency for an extended period of time. You always supplement through free agency you supplement through trades, but you have to continue to build your team through the draft. And, you know, having, I don't know how many picks we have, but I think it's 10, 12 picks, something like that this year. You have to do well with those draft picks. You always have to do well. And doing well doesn't mean all 10 of those guys make your roster and they're all starters, right? You, you have to make sure that you're getting guys like George Kittle, like Dre, like Fred, you know, that, that are not you know, first round guys, but guys that, that have impact deeper in the rounds, right? You have to make sure that the, the picks that you make, make your team successful. So you can pay somebody, whether it's your quarterback or somebody else, and we are gonna have to pay our quarterback soon. But, you know, probably leading to your next question, like Brandon, guys that you draft, like I'd much rather pay guys that we draft than guys that we didn't draft. And we're gonna do everything that we can, like we have in the past to, to find a way to make those work but it's a lot easier to pay people that you drafted, that you know that you helped kind of raise in your team and in your system, than overpaying in free agency outside of, of your team for guys that are much more unknown from a character standpoint, from how they are in the building standpoint, and that's that's always going to be the key for us. And, and I guess part of that too, you you want to pay those guys, like you said, but it, it gets a little top heavy when it you does. do it, and then you have the only way to, to backfill it is yes. to, to again hit through the draft. Right? And again, like, I think we're in a good problem where you have a lot of guys that we've drafted that we've paid and given contracts to, and you can't keep everybody all the time. I, I wish that you could, but that's the that's the reason why you you have to continue to go back to the draft. Like at some point, you have to build through the draft.
Is it tough to accept that you have lost a fifth round pick next year because you overpaid a player by $75,000 a couple of years ago? I mean, there's so many things that I would really like to say about that. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> but but it's, it's one of those things where, in our opinion, we did everything that we could to try to get the money back from the player. And to me, $75,000 on what the salary cap is is a pretty insignificant number. I, in hindsight, we should have said something right away to the league and you certainly know that moving forward. I don't, we didn't gain a competitive advantage from it. Like there, there wasn't any try to like duplicity in it, but it is what it is. And, and again, the league might not be your best friend on every single day, but you know that they hold all 32 teams accountable. And I know that they'll look at every other team and no one is gonna get a competitive advantage by trying to skirt salary cap and things like that. Like they're always gonna be on top of those things where you might not like it when the discipline comes down on you. You respect that the fact that this league is governed very, very well, and they will always make sure that they're doing what they can to keep the game as honest as possible. Thinking financially, how thankful are you that you have guys like Kyle Juszczyk, Fred Warner, George Kittle that are willing and able to adjust their contracts? And I mean, they're, they're awesome. And they're, they're, they're teammates, they're, they're players on our team, but I mean, in a sense, they're, they, they are partners. Right, and you have those guys that, you know, I, I want to make sure that they have great careers and they make a lot of money. But I also want to make sure that a guy like Kyle, his, he's here with his wife this week. She's building out a business. Like, if we can help, whether it's a player or a player's spouse, build and grow their business, like we want to be able to do that. Like, we we want to be a, a family atmosphere, and you know, they show that it's a family atmosphere on their side as well, where they're willing to make adjustments so we can do what we can to try to go win a Super Bowl. And I think those are little things that give us an advantage to to sort of stay in that mix and stay in that hunt where your, your window of winning a Super Bowl can be, you know, extended because guys are willing to work with you to stay on the team, but also give you the, the room to be able to go attract more people to come into the club. Was part of you disappointed that Eric Armstead wasn't willing to work with you in that way? I wouldn't say he wasn't willing to work with us. He he felt like he was willing to work with us and we had a good conversation with Eric. He just asked if he could test what his market value was and he, he knew what we offered him and I think he was appreciative that we did it in a way that gave him the opportunity to test the market and see. And you know, for a guy that's played nine years for the club and has done amazing things on the field, off the field, it's a lot easier for us to work with him where, you know, I, I, I don't want to see him go somewhere else, but he was able to see what his value was. And I think we owed him the opportunity to do that. And we gave him that respect. And I think that's where other people see that and say, okay, well, I'm, I'm willing to work with you and because we have an open, honest relationship with our players. And I'd, I'd love Eric to be here. And I told him as we were going through the process, like you're always going to be a 49er. You know, you, you have Bay Area roots, like you're, you're a Northern California guy. Like, you know, when you retire, like we hope you do it with the 49ers and, and that you're here with us for a long period of time as a great alumni. But I, I also understand it's a business for everybody and we wanna be as helpful as we can to our players, obviously not hurting ourselves, but being as helpful as we can to players to make sure that their career is as successful as they can be on and off the field. With, like, with the groundwork, you know, like he'll be off the books in two years. Sorry. He'll be off the Eric. books in two years. How much groundwork do you have to kind of put into place for the likelihood that Brock Purdy will blow? I mean, the, probably the guarantee he'll be the highest paid player on the team and the likelihood of one of the highest paid players in the NFL next year. I mean, I think it's a good problem when, when your quarterback is one of your highest paid guys on your team and in the league. Um, so there's a lot of planning that goes into it. But, you know, again, I'm, I'm glad that we have Prague, JL, Kyle. Like, they're, they're the ones that will figure out the details of it. And I just have to sign the check. So my, my part in that's pretty easy. <laughs> but kind of hard, too, isn't it? It's not, it's not hard. I, I mean, it's just it, it's what the market is, right? Like, it's not like... Brock is going to ask for something that no one has ever asked for before. You have, I don't know how many players making over $40 million as a quarterback right now. And when we signed Jimmy several years ago, you know, it was, it was the largest deal in the history of the NFL for three minutes. <laughs> but we, we were paying Jimmy 26 or 27. And you see, like, the market has just, it's changed. And 
I, like, whether I like it or not, like that's what the market is. And you have to accept the reality of the world. And to me, the quarterback is the most important position, not just in football, but in all sports. And those guys should be paid a lot of money. How proud are you of the fact that when you come to these meetings, you see all of the people that came from your organization that have learned from John, from Kyle, from everybody that's been in the building? I, I mean, that's, those are the things that, you know, in 2010, I, I, don't, I don't know that I realized like how important it was for us to, to have the type of organization that was looked at and, and like truly looked at as a place where we were a model for a lot of other teams in professional sports. So when you come here, it feels like, you know, it's our, our team meeting room in 2019, when you see folks that are general managers of teams, head coaches of teams, and it's a, it's a testament to what we've all collectively built, and certainly John and Kyle are putting together a great group of people. And it's, it's rewarding to see that I think our league has changed, and I think we have a much different group of people that are running clubs today than what we did 10, 15 years ago, and just the process of that has changed significantly. The diversity has changed, and I think that the, the idea of making football more of a transparent business, I, I think you see that with the guys that have come from our organization and how they handle themselves and how they interact with their players and people. I think it makes the league a better place. Take two more guys. I have a question. Oh, this is awesome. <laughs> I can't wait. Let's go. Let's go. Uh, of course, I'm totally excited about Anthony Becker's uh, injury trial and uh, mm -hmm. Rico Shandock is going to be expected to testify. Okay. What are your feelings on that? And do you expect any other 49 officials to testify? I, I mean, I have no idea. I, you'd have to ask our legal team about who they expect and things like that with to, with to testify. And I have really no thoughts, feelings, opinions on on any of the legal matters that are going on. The uh, Leeds ownership, the 49ers Enterprises is on, yep. is on the majority now. Does it come up on a year, I think? It's this several season, months. Yeah. yeah. Have you been out there? Has anything in your day-to-day -day changed? And, and what are you um, looking forward to most of that? You know, I mean, we, we're doing a lot changing behind the scenes. Prague is there probably more frequently than I am. I, I would say I'm there quarterly. Prague's probably there monthly, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, so like our spring break is coming up in a couple weeks. So I'll go out with the boys. Jax has seen a game. Brixie hasn't been to a game yet. So it'll be their first time together going to a game. Um, but from a day-to-day -day standpoint, you know, we're continuing to build and grow what we do. And I wouldn't say it's really affected what I do with the 49ers, but I'm definitely there more than what I was before we, we took over full control. Hey, guys. Jim, uh, yeah. I actually last one. Thank you. Thank you. That is fine. Um, but when you talk about you know, just the different in terms of philosophy as far as looking at what constitutes a successful season, yep. I mean, any dude would probably, yeah, even though, you know, Great, great, great Super Bowl. I mean, is that a reflection of you just kind of growing into your own person as an owner? Well, I mean, there's there's a difference between when he ran the club and, and, and with us. Like, you know, you guys bring up how do you pay Brock and salary cap? Like, Eddie didn't have a salary cap, right? And if we didn't have a salary cap, like, Brandon would have been done three weeks ago or whatever it was and like you wouldn't like he's a guy that you love that you'd want to keep like it, but it's not always a question of like do you love these guys Eric like you wouldn't you wouldn't let a guy like Eric Armstead go if you if you had no salary cap so th those are things that have changed and it's trying to accept the realities of what the NFL is and knowing that that there's only so many things that you can control when you have a fixed cap the things that I can control are how our team functions in the community, what, what they represent. Like I, I can have a direct impact on that. I can't necessarily have a direct impact on what play do we call on fourth and three. So it, it, it's more of a realization as you go through it. And some of it is a maturing process, but it's, it's hard when your standard was set in a relatively 
sort of unachievable way of the 49ers that I grew up with. Like it's very, very hard to do that unless you have the best quarterback in the league and you know, you're, you're relatively destined to be in the Super Bowl. Like, I think we have a great quarterback. I, I don't know that anybody is Patrick Mahomes. I don't know that anybody is what Tom Brady was in their prime, in his prime. So you have to be able to build a franchise that can compete with those types of players. And, and that's, that's what I'm proud of. And I think our team has every bit of an opportunity to go win Super Bowls, but we'll never stop competing for that. I just feel like when I, when I experienced a loss to Baltimore, like I, I literally thought like my life was gonna end. Right, the first time the 49ers ever lost a Super Bowl, and like it's just this big shameful thing. And then you just take a step back, and it's like we were number two. Like if anybody else was number two, you 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 keep working, but you would be proud of your accomplishments. And it's trying to figure out that balance of we always want to keep pushing, but you you can't shame yourself for being second, right? But you're always going to keep working, and that that's how I feel. So. But personality-wise, it seemed like this is me, me talking about this. Like I, I've got to punch a wall because we just lost. That's. I mean, it seemed like it was an Eddie thing to do. It, it, it feels like yeah. maybe you. you I mean, but that's 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 what I, that's that's what I grew up like. He's not he's not my father, but we generally. And there's always like you, your children will do what you do, not what you say. Right, like you, you, you watch that type of mentality, and and I think it's the right mentality to have. Like we're gonna do everything that we can to win. Like watching my kids cry after this loss. It's like, why well, can't act like an eleven-year-old if my eleven-year-old is acting like an eleven-year-old? <laughs> so, like you, you have to, you have to be the leader, and you have to be able to say, all right, like let's regroup, because me breaking my hand in that moment is not gonna make us win. Right, so there's a maturity standpoint, but you but you have to figure out how do we regroup and know that you you can't compete against the best quarterback unless you have an entire organization like going in one direction, and it's a lot harder to do it when you have that type of mentality. But I will put our team up against anybody, and we we have to find a way to get over that final hump, and I. I have a more, I, I laughed about this with Collinsworth last night. Like, you know, I, I used to, you know, dig him a little bit when he would have sort of a negative 49er tone. It's like, I, I get it. Like, you lost to Joe Montana twice. Like, I have a much better understanding of how you feel today. And that's, they had great teams, but they, they didn't get over the hump. And I, I know how hard it is, but I think with our group, I think we can get over that hump. And I think Brock has a chance to be one of those guys. He's only played two years. Like he, I think he has a chance to be at that level of like truly, truly great at the position. And he's still learning and growing, but we have to make sure that we support him as much as we can as an organization. And you know, we don't have the luxury of having the second highest paid quarterback being our backup quarterback the way that my uncle did. I wish we did. That would be fantastic. I would love to have a, a roster of starting quarterbacks that could be pro bowlers. That's just not the way the league works now. So you have to adjust. Uh, the meaning of principal owner, why is that a move that's... I, I mean, I think it's just a, a move from a family standpoint to just keep this team and our family for generations to come. I, I think it's reflective of sort of how we've operated. And my parents are gonna say that co-chairman, I don't think you're gonna see really any change. It's much more of a long-term family planning thing and making sure that this team stays in our family for, for generations to come. So how much of, how much ownership, what's your percentage of ownership? Um, I, I mean, I'm not gonna get into direct ownership percentages, but my family owns 97% of the team. And you know we'll we'll continue to keep that in our family and continue to move forward. Was this a plan for quite some time? Yeah, I mean I don't know. Estate planning stuff is it's always a unique process within families, and you know it's just something that we've always discussed. And I think watching different family successions and seeing how reading a will can be very different than having a conversation when everybody's still 
around and available to walk through and talk through and sort of get from where we are to where we're going. We just thought it was a better process to just sort of like transition into it smoothly. And again, being a very close family, I don't ever anticipate any problems with my family, but it's just a, it's an easier, smoother transition to make sure that this team stays in our family. If any insight into the compensatory pick uh, thing that happened, uh, you guys were expecting, I think, a third round pick, and instead there was a fourth. I had Buffalo's GM talked about it a little bit today. Yeah, I mean, that would probably be more Prague and, and JL to, to give you specifics. And I, I don't know. I, I've, I've been in the NFL long enough to know that what, what you expect and what actually happens aren't always the same things. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll let them address it. And whatever it is, we still have an extra pick. We'll, we'll move forward and, and we'll, we'll be fine. You were one of the three teams that voted against the new kickoff rule. What was correct? Yes. What, what was the reason? What, what, what's your biggest concern? I, I think the concern is it's such a drastic change to a play that has really kind of, from a health and safety standpoint, we, we've tried to address the play because it was the, the most, I, I think the highest injury rate play that, that existed. So they're going from that to trying to reintroduce the play into the game and, and make it more of a real play as opposed to ceremonial play. And I'm 100% for that. I just want to make sure with something that's brand new that we had the opportunity to address it during the middle of the season, that if there's injury data or just a competitive issue that you know doesn't work, that it's not, this is the asterisk season of the, the kickoff rule that, that didn't work. I'm 100% for trying to make that play active in our game again. And I think they, they put in a ton of time and a ton of effort to try to make something work. I, I'm just sure that there's gonna be tweaks to it. And I'd rather tweak it if we have to in the middle of the season, as opposed to here's the asterisk season and then we're gonna tweak it at, at the end of the year. That's it.